Hi, my name is Paul Anderson and I've been teaching biology in Montana for almost 20 years and I wanted to share with you a study that came out in 2011 and I'll put a link to this in the video description down below. But basically they asked high school biology teachers, these are in public schools, do you teach evolution in your class? And what they found is that only 28% of them do. 13% of these biology teachers are actually teaching creationism and then 60% are choosing to teach neither. And what do I mean by teach? It means that only 28% of these biology teachers are spending at least an hour throughout the course of the entire year talking about evolution, presenting evidence that supports this idea. Um, and so this is pretty alarming to me. Now you'll notice right away that the numbers don't quite add up to 100% and that's just rounding. Um, but my message to my fellow biology teachers is that teaching evolution is not optional. Um, if you're a public high school teacher and you're teaching biology, you need to teach evolution. So I want to start by talking to those 13%. And so if you're 13% of the teachers who teach creationism, I want you to understand that the law is really not on your side. It was decided in 1968 that a state district school can't ban the teaching of evolution. This was further refined uh, in 1987 when it was said that a state district school can't require equal time for teaching creationism or creation science. In 1990, a teacher can't teach creationism freelance. In other words, you can't just kind of go on your own and teach what you believe. Uh, and then finally, in 2005, it was decided that intelligent design is not science and cannot be adjudged a valid accepted scientific theory. And so if you're a biology teacher in a public school and you're teaching creation science or intelligent design or whatever you want to call it, you're actually breaking the law. Um, and so it's been, de it's been decided in the courts that you can't do that. And I probably can't change your mind. So I want to talk to that 60%, the 60% of teachers that are just not teaching either. And I don't know why they're doing that. I would imagine that they're probably doing it to avoid controversy and they don't want to argue with their kids and there's a number of other reasons why. But what you need to understand is that you really are putting your kids behind. And what do I mean by that? Well, let's look at your teacher organization. So the NSTA decided, so the National Science Teachers Association, put this out, that science curricula, state science standards, and teachers should emphasize evolution in a manner commensurate with its importance as a unifying concept in, t in science and its overall explanatory power. So that is your organization, science teaching organization. Let's look at the actual content. So this is from the K-12 science framework. If you don't understand what that means, this K-12 science framework right now will become the science standards and in a majority of the states this is going to become the curriculum. And they say that evolution and its underlying genetic mechanisms of inheritance and variability are key to understanding both the unity and diversity of life on Earth. And in this framework, you'll see at least 30 different times where they address this idea of evolution. Let's say you're teaching AP Biology. Uh, well, they've refined their curriculum to the point where 25% of the curriculum addresses this big idea. The process of evolution drives the diversity and unity of life. Why is that important? Just like when you're learning physics, it's important for you to understand gravity because we can build up on that or to understand acceleration and then we can build upon that. You really need to understand evolution to understand biology appropriately. If we were to look at the IB program, the concept of evolution draws together the other themes. It can be regarded as change leading to diversity within constraints and this leads to adaptations of structure and function. In other words, it has been decided that evolution is real and it's important in understanding biology. And if you're not convinced by that, maybe you're convinced by this guy. This is Bill Nye. He has a wonderful video where he talks about this and implores parents that if you want to deny evolution and live in a world that's completely inconsistent with everything we observe in the universe, that's fine. But don't make your kids do it because we need them. We need scientifically literate voters and taxpayers for the future. We need engineers that can build stuff and solve problems. And so I find this in my class that evolution is not inherently easy to understand. And so it's sad that people prey upon that and say that it's not true or it's not science. It is science and the whole science of biology is built upon it. And it's a little scary because a lot of uh, famous scientists, E.O. Wilson for that matter, says that the next hundred years will be the next hundred years of biology. It will be the century of biology. 
his idea is that the last century really belonged to physics and all of these advances that were made in physics, but now it's biology's turn. And we really are going to need students and kids and scientists that understand the principles of evolution. So I'm a little confused, and when I get confused about something like this, I think maybe there's historical significance. In other words, maybe there's a, a historical reason why this is. And if, I, if I'm ever thinking about history, then I go to my friend, um, Hip Hughes History. And so this is Keith Hughes, and so I would encourage you to visit his, his website. But my question for you, Keith, is how did we get to this point? In other words, how did we get in America to the point where we're not willing to teach science? And so please address that, if you would. Give us some of the history, and then I'd love to hear your opinion as well. Hey, Mr. Anderson, thanks for asking me the question because I think that the video that you're making is really important and I do think that the history kind of has a message for us. I think that first I would look back really at the roots of American government and we find a lot of Puritanism in, in, in the Northeast, especially in government, and that's going to bleed into public policy. So I think that traditionally we've always kind of had this mix of government and, and religious fundamentalism, to be quite honest with you. And I also think that the lack of clarity in the Constitution is kind of a, a source of the problem as well. There's no separation of church and state in the Constitution. In fact, other than really banning the organization of a national religion, it protects the free exercise of religion. Um, and then having a lack of clarity about, you know, science and education and those issues, the Tenth Amendment says that those powers not in the Constitution are reserved for the state. So there we have the state, you know, in charge of these very important decisions. And um, I think even the state would be a wide variety of people. You'd have a lot of voices in there. But then it's sent down to local school districts where, you know, quite honestly, sometimes you can get people who maybe lack access to the facts or don't believe in science. And those people influence what happens in the classroom. Um, but I think that really you have to look at the Scopes trial because I think the Scopes trial really rather than answering it, answers why we haven't answered it. Um, the, the typical way the Scopes trial is, is taught is John Scopes, once upon a time, was teaching science evolution in Tennessee, 1925. He violates the Butler Act, which said you couldn't teach you know, evolution in the schools. He's arrested, he's carted off to jail, and a trial emerges of, you know, kind of fundamentalism versus modernism. Um, and we will answer that question. And I think that that's not what really happened. Um, in fact, um, I don't want to get too deep into the facts, but John Scopes was a substitute teacher who didn't even remember if he taught evolution. He's one of those guys on the chart that Mr. Anderson showed you that's not doing anything, right? So why would he be the defendant? Because it's a sham. It's a media circus sham which was put together by business forces and the prosecutor and some local other lawyers in town to really create tourism and make a big media circus out of the whole issue. So uh, John Scopes knew the prosecutor, um, who was a boy named Sue. I kid you not, Google it right now, Scopes trial, boy named Sue, and you'll find out where Charles Darrow for the modernist, and he's a top lawyer in the country, and he's going to question William Jennings Bryan on the stand, who was a Democratic nominee for president, who represents fundamentalism and the literal interpretation of the Bible. Um, at the end of the day, I think both sides come out with kind of marginal victories, and, um, you know, uh, Scopes is found guilty, a uh, $100 fine overturned on appeal, and William Jennings Bryan is, is basically taken apart on the stand by, by Darrow, trying to defend some stories in the Bible literally, like um, you know, parting the Red Sea or the, the whale on the belly and those types of things. Um, but really, I think that it doesn't answer the question. It leaves this big open space where nothing has been determined. So while Mr. Anderson is right, we have these court cases like, uh, great job with the court cases by the way, like Epperson versus Arkansas, which basically forbids creationism, that you have to teach evolution, um, really not being taken seriously because it was never really pushed for. So I, I turn it back to you, Mr. Anderson. I don't know what the answer is, but I'm with you, whether it's in the science or the social studies, that we need to really present accurate curriculum to our kids in a thoughtful, designed way so we can, we can get some people in the world that are qualified for jobs and that are uh, intelligent citizens. So uh, there you go. I, I know that I'm going to have a question sooner or later for you, Mr. Anderson, because history is filled with science, just like science is filled with history. I blew my mind. All right, guys, I'll talk to you later. 
Thanks, Keith. That was amazing. And I'd be willing to help out if you ever have any kind of science questions. It's nice to know that we're kind of on the same page. And so I've already talked to the 13%. I've already talked to the 60%. But now I really want to talk to those 28%. If you're teaching evolution in your class, thank you. That's awesome. Uh, that's what you should be doing. But what I think we need to do is to grow that 28%. And the nice thing about being in that 28% is that you have two things on your side. You have the law, that's what we are required to do, and then more importantly, you have the science. And so a lot of people don't understand how a science book is written. A science book is written with science. In other words, scientists do research, and the research piles up, it's published in journals, but eventually we have all of this research that suggests how the world works. And if we simply want to avoid that, I think we do it at our own peril. Thanks.